Thank you. You guys are, are too nice. Hello, wonderful CSUN students. And I say that from the bottom of my heart, wonderful CSUN students. I'm Dr. Mark Stevens. I'm a psychologist and director of University Counseling Services. And I've come today to talk with you about succeeding academically. I know that you want to succeed academically. We want you to succeed academically. You've come here with some dreams about what it means to succeed, to graduate. And so I'm going to call you the dream makers, the CSUN student dream makers, making your dreams come true. And I'm going to call myself, for today, the dream navigator. Because all dream makers need some dream navigators. And you're fortunate that at this university, there's lots of dream navigators besides myself. We have them at the Learning Resource Center, at the Career Center, at the Math Lab, tutors, advisors, your professors. Lots of folks that want to help navigate that dream that you have. So I've got seven steps that I'd like to share with you as your dream, personal dream navigator for today that can help you fulfill your dreams. Step number one is remembering your purpose. Why did you come to college? Now, when I ask you that question, it's not like, hey, how you doing? And you go, fine. Anything new? Nothing. Because sometimes we say that, and we don't really think about it. And we're not being real genuine. And we do what I call just kind of this fist bump. Yeah, how are you? Boom. But I'm asking you to do more than a fist bump. I'm asking you to really hug this question with sincerity, which is, why did you come to CSUN. Why do you want a college degree? That's your purpose. Your purpose has this nice, wonderful dream, kind of a dream bubble in there. And in that dream is, I want a career. I want to be happy. I want to make more money than my parents. I want to buy a home. I want to learn. I want to learn how to learn. I want to make my parents proud. I want to be a good role model for my younger siblings and my younger family members. Because I know that many of you, your first generation college students, you've got this wonderful dream. And so step number one is remembering your purpose. So that dream stays alive. Your dream is your engine to academic success. It's the reason that you've come to CSUN. It's your engine. When you have a choice, should I be spending time studying for this, or should I be doing this, that may not be connected to the dream, your purpose will allow you, you're remembering your purpose, will allow you to make the good choices. Now, don't just remember it up here. It's OK to do that. But put it around. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your mirror. Write it down on your books. What your purpose is. Give that purpose a hug. Remind yourself of your purpose as often as you can, because that really is your engine towards success. Step number two. You all have come to the university with some sense of academic confidence, academic knowledge. Step number two is getting a feel for where your academic confidence is and some steps to improve that. Let me show you sort of with a metaphor about what I mean by academic confidence and knowing what your academic worth is. You can probably see that this is money. But you don't know how much it's worth. It's, it's worth something. But you don't know how much it's worth because it's been crumbled. Now, I'll show you the same type of piece of paper. It's made out of the same ingredients as this is. 
And this is money that you can see is worth $20. You know what it's worth because it's not crumbled. This dollar bill is going around, I feel pretty good about myself. This piece of money is going, I don't know how much I'm worth. Other people don't know how much I'm worth. I've been crumbled. I'm kind of embarrassed of being crumbled. People don't know how much I'm worth. So the metaphor here is that this is money that has really good academic confidence. And this is money that's sort of suffering from academic confidence. There, there's nobody at the university like this, and there's nobody at the university like this. There's nobody at any university that's like this, or nobody at any university that's like this. But each and every one of you, to a certain degree, have been a little bit crumbled. And sometimes there's some feelings that are associated with feeling crumbled. Sometimes there's shame, there's embarrassment. And so step number two is acknowledging how you've been crumbled. In some ways, it's, it's what I call you've experienced academic trauma, you know, where you're walking around like this and then a teacher or a, a sibling or a parent or a friend says something to you like, ooh, you're not very good at that. Or you get back a test grade and go, oh, I must be stupid. I'm, I'm never going to be good at this. And guess what? You start to believe that. And you start to walk around a little bit crumbled. And you're not proud of that. So you kind of go in hiding. And you come into class or you, with this kind of attitude about, I'm not very good at this. Well, now that you're in college, you get to change your academic identity. You get to wake up and say, do I always have to be like that? You get to define your academic worth and not have other people define it for you. Well, I've been telling myself this, this message since I've been in second grade, but now I'm in college, can I change that? And the answer is absolutely yes. Intelligence is not fixed. You can do things to improve areas that you have been crumbled. And today, the first step is for you to uncrumble, to identify how you've been crumbled, and without shame, to say, I don't need to be that way. Nobody has been taken away to jail because you're not very good at math or not good speller, that's me. It's not a crime. But sometimes we feel like it's a crime, and we go into hiding. And as you start to do that, one of the first things that you're going to want to do is ask for help. Oftentimes, people that feel a little bit crumbled are a little bit embarrassed to ask for help. Help is so important. First, you need an attitude about help seeking. And that attitude is, I deserve it. I deserve to ask for help. You deserve to ask for help from me, from your professors, from your TAs, from the Learning Resource Center, all around campus. You deserve it. You came here. We want to offer you help. But sometimes you're a little bit embarrassed to ask for help. So you avoid it. You're afraid maybe you're going to be shamed. You feel like, oh, I'm not going to ask for help. I'm just, you know, just going to just get right through it. Interesting, the very best students ask for more help than the students that are struggling. I find that really interesting. So you, you've got the attitude. I deserve to ask for help. You've embraced that. Then the next part is, how do you ask for help? You know, there's a... a a technique to ask for help that's really effective, but you're going to have to do a little bit of homework. And the technique is to know where you're stuck, to know what you know and where you get stuck, so that when you go to your tutor, you're going, I understand this, I understand this, I understand this. Mm. I'm stuck. Help me get unstuck. I don't understand that. I ask you not just to go to a tutor and say, I need help with this. 
Do your homework. This is how I need help. This is where I'm stuck. That guides your tutor a little bit, your helper a little bit more. So now you're going and you've got that confidence. I deserve to ask for help. You know how to do it. And you go and you sit down and you ask for help. Now sometimes in your mind you're going, OK, is this person going to like me? Are they going to think I'm stupid? Whatever that may message is you're doing. So you go and you ask for help. You say, can you please help me with this problem? And they try to help you. And they say, do you get it? And you go, uh, no. Still don't get it. OK. Let's try it a different way. Okay. Can I help you with this? Do, 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 do. You get it. Now you're starting to get a little tight in your stomach. Your breathing's starting to change a little bit. You're going, I still don't get it. Is this person impatient? Is there someone else waiting? Are they going to shame me? Whatever that may be. And you go, uh, no, I, I still don't get it. But you're starting to get a little worried. Third time, the tutor says, OK, let's try it this way. Now, they're still talking nice to you. Maybe they're giving you a little bit of a vibe, and you're going, oh, gosh. And they're going, do you get it? Do you get it? And you've got so much internal pressure that even though you don't understand it, you go like this. They ask you, do you get it now? And you go, yes. It's what I call the glazed eye nod. How many of you have done the glazed eye nod before? Thank you. You've done it with teachers. You've done it with your parents. You've done it with other people, right? Your head is going, yes, but your eyes are saying, I don't understand it. Well, you don't need to do that. You don't need to give the glazed eye nod. You're an adult now. And I encourage you to use this technique. And you can use it not only with your tutor, but you can use it with your boyfriend, girlfriend, parents, is to be assertive and say, you know, I, I appreciate the time you're giving me. I got to let you know that I'm feeling, starting to feel a little bit nervous that you're becoming impatient with me. I really do want your help. Um, and once you say that out loud, sometimes you feel a little bit better on the inside. And the other person says, no, don't worry about it. I don't ha I'm, I'm with you until we get it. And you go, phew, that's great. So that was step number three. Asking for help. Ah, now we're going to move to step number four. The most important part of your body when it comes to learning is your brain. And you're feeding your brain lots of stuff all the time that either enhances your learning or inhibits your learning. Hopefully, you're feeding it water, exercise, Almonds, dried fruit, sleep, sleep. Don't go to sleep now. Sleep. Very important to your brain. But also, besides those kind of physical activities which increase blood flow and good stuff like that, you're also feeding your brain attitude. What's really interesting is that your brain listens to everything that you say, even when you don't say it out loud. You cannot fool your brain. It listens to you. And then it responds, because it doesn't know if you're telling the truth in terms of like you don't really want this to happen. It's just going to listen to it. Let me give you an example. See how many of you can relate to this. You're walking into class, and you're having an internal dialogue before you get to class. And you're going, oh boy, an hour. Got to listen to this professor. Oh, I don't really understand her. God, I wish I'm really hungry. I wish I wasn't here. I wish I was doing something else. And then you sit down. Usually not in the front row. You're way back there. Well, what have you just told your brain? You've just told your brain, I don't want to be here. Kind of shut off a little bit. Don't listen to the professor. And your brain, unfortunately, will listen. It might get tired. It might start to wander because you haven't told your brain, I want to be here. Your attitude about this learning behavior is critical. 
Another example. How many of you have done this? Professor says, read chapters three and four. And you go, OK. You've got to be kidding me. Oh, I'm not even halfway through chapter three. Oh, come on. I'm not going to have a weekend. How many of you have done that? Thank you for your honesty. I've never met anybody that says they've never done it. So we're sort of looking at, at learning and going, when am I going to get it over with? Learning becomes sort of a chore. I don't want to be there. Again, your attitude says to your brain, it's a chore. And then your brain doesn't bring in stuff quite as well when it feels like it's a, a chore. Now that's not, on some level, it's not your fault. I won't go into all why it's not your fault. It's a little bit your fault. But I encourage you to remember what it was like to learn when you were younger. Kindergarten, first grade. I'm learning. You go home to your parents, whoever, your grandparents. I just learned this. You didn't even know you were learning. You were just learning, and you were having fun. You remember that? Wasn't that wonderful? And now, somehow, it's moved from learning is joyful to it's kind of a chore. I invite you to, to experiment with something. Try this out. Go on a road trip with your book. Maybe just chapters you know, four or five. Go on a road trip. Road trips are great, aren't they? You, know, you sort of don't know where you're going to end up. And you're just like, everything. whatever happens, it's, 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 it's wonderful. Try reading your book without looking how many pages you have to read. Open it up and go, hmm, let me get, oh, and start to see the story of it. Start to engage your book. Start to go, where is this going to go? Why is this author saying this? Start to relate to it personally. That really helps. So uplift your attitude about learning. Step Number five, purposeful effort. Effort in the short run usually pays off. But effort in the long run always pays off. Effort, purposeful effort, always pays off. Let me give you a personal example. As you've been listening to me and watching me, you go, boy, that guy has what? biceps on him. Are you laughing? And let me tell you how I got these. Because there's about seven years ago, I was talking to my friend Tony, and I said, Tony, you know, how do you, you know, how, how, how did you get that, those, those biceps? He goes, oh, Mark, it's easy. I go to the gym four days a week, two hours at a time. I've been doing it for a while. I go, well, I can do that. So for the last eight years, on Mondays, Thursdays, Saturday, and Sunday, got a routine. If I miss a day, I'll make it up another day. I have it set time. I joined a gym, and I go. So get off of work. So I'm going to go to the gym. I get there around 6 o'clock, walk in, say, well, hey, how you doing? How you doing? Got my seat there. Come sit down. Bring water you know, something to hydrate. Sometimes I bring the uh, sundial and read that. And, OK, it's 6 o'clock. All right. Start getting some water, reading. Oh. I'm watching these guys, women working out, lifting. And I'm going, hmm. All right. 8 o'clock. Oh, 8 o'clock. Time for me to leave. I've been doing this for eight years, paying off, right? Thank you for laughing. So where am I going with this? You're going to the gym every single day. You're going to the academic gym every single day, whether it's in the library, at your home, in the classroom. But the question is, when you go to this academic gym, 
are you building this muscle up here, which is the most important part of your body when it comes to learning? Are you lifting? Or are you just going to class and showing up? Effort counts. It pays off. Are you engaged in the process? Are you putting the time in? Are you just doing it to get it over with? Or are you lifting? When you go to class, are you engaged? Are you raising your hand and asking a question if you don't know something? Are you preparing before the lecture so that the lecture makes a whole bunch of sense? You all know the difference when you've prepared and when you haven't prepared. It feels so good when you've read it and you come into class, you're confident, and the professor's telling you and you're raising your hand and you understand that. Professor makes a mistake and you go, Professor, according, and they go, oh, yes, you're right. Thank you very much. That's because of effort. And it feels really good. And effort grows your brain. Step number six, comprehension. Excuse me one second. Oh, shucks. Can you guys turn off the cameras, please, for just one second? Let me see. I've got to take this. I'm going to be home at 6.30. I've gotten better at texting a little bit, but hold on one second. You don't mind turning off the cameras for a second? Uh, OK. All right. Well, while they're off, do you mind if I check this email? I've got this email I've got to, to check, too. All right, I'll be back. All right, OK. Thank you. Turn them back on. Um, what was I talking about? Uh, what was I? <laughs> Forgot what I was talking about. Oh, comprehension. You guys, when it comes to comprehension, are the most compromised generation of all time when it comes to comprehension. Of all time. Why do I say that? It's not your fault. But you've been birthed with so many distraction magnets, so many of them. You've got your cell phone. You've got your computer. You've got your TV set. You're gaming. You're doing all of this stuff. By the way, just one little lesson. There's a button usually. It could be on the top. could be on the side. If you press it, you don't have to press it really hard, but long enough. It actually turns off. But why I say that's so important around comprehension is that while you're attempting to study, comprehension is the taking in of material, you tend to have these distraction magnets all around you. Because you're ready for that really important text message, how you doing, what are you having for dinner, and you go from here to there. Go on, let me just surf the internet for a little bit. Hold on one second. And you start surfing. See, I'm only going to do it for 10 minutes. And an hour and a half later, you're, you're back to your comprehension in your book. You go out on dates sometimes. How many of you would like to go out on a date? All right. And that person that's on the other side of the table has a whole bunch of distraction magnets. You know, you're trying to talk, and they're going, they're looking there. You're not feeling very good. Well, your books, you guys, your generation has rejected books because they know there's all these other distraction magnets. Your book wants you to stay committed to it. Your brain wants you to stay committed to your learning, to your books. Well, guess what? Your generation is the number one rejectors of books. We've got a whole support group for books because they feel so rejected by you guys. So step number six is, and I've, I've never lost anybody on this. Nobody's gone to jail. Nobody's died. Put away your distraction magnets when you're focusing in on your studying. Know your distraction magnets, because you all they're a little bit different. Some people like the cell phone. Some people like the TV. Some people like the computer. Know what they are. Have some reflection. and. Turn them off. Experiment. See what that is like. I think it will be OK. Commit yourself 
to your book. Step number seven. This is one of my favorite ones. Remembering your proud learning moments. Oh, you've had lots of them. Each and every one of you have had wonderful proud learning moments. Some of you have learned English, English as your second language. You've learned how to ride a bike. You've taken an exam or a class that you thought, oh, I don't think I'm going to do very well at it. And you're telling your brain. And then your brain says, hmm, nope, I really want this. I want this bad. And then what you do is you go, OK, I start to make some sacrifices. I put more time into studying on that Saturday. I asked for help. I want this really bad. Oh, I don't get this. I'm not giving up. And you continue to know that you want it very bad. You're putting in effort. You've got the right attitude. And then, ha ha, you've had a proud learning moment because you've had a success at it. And it feels so good. Again, each and every one of you have had these wonderful, proud learning moments. Remember them. We remember the bad stuff, unfortunately, easier than we do the good stuff. Remember them. And when you come into a time of your life that you're struggling, it could be personal, it could be academic, bring that out and say, hmm, you know, I've done more difficult things. I've survived more difficult things. I have a history of being able to deal with adversity. And all of that, that recipe of a proud learning moment, is the recipe for academic success. It involves, I can do it. It involves putting in effort, making sacrifices. It involves resiliency, because you don't get it right away. It involves asking for help. Asking for help and not giving up. And then, ooh -hoo. I want for you all that CSUN is one of these proud learning moments, that you'll look back on your education here and going, I did OK. I put in effort. I remembered my, my dream. And I leave you with this. May your dreams of today, and you've got them, be the reality of your tomorrow. Guys, thank you very much for your attention. Big hugs to you all. Thank you.